We'll be in Psalm 66, if you'd like to open up your Bibles. Father, we pray a blessing on your word tonight. And we just ask, Father, that in spite of, of the noise of the planes, and Lord, we do appreciate um, all of our men and women who stand for us and for our freedom to meet here tonight. Uh, we don't bemoan that at all. And we're thankful for them and for their dedication and sacrifice. But, Father, I do pray that you will help us not miss your word tonight. That even the noise of the, of the planes will not distract from us being seated with the truth. And especially tonight, I, I, I pray this every week, Father, but tonight just amazes me. And I ask that we would all have opportunity to hear the word and to be touched and, and moved by the word. Father, we pray this, asking for your spirit to teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 66 is where we'll begin. Before we do that, um, we're going, we're going to do three psalms tonight, 66, 7, and 8. And uh, wow, again, just wow. This amazes me. Revelation 19.10, one of my favorite verses in Scripture, says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Or translated in another way, the testimony of Jesus is the breath of prophecy. In other words, prophecy is about Jesus. It points us to Jesus. It all comes back to him. But there's a secondary reason we so frequently focus on Bible prophecy here at the bridge. You may recall that scene in the, in the movie, the great movie, Chariots of Fire, one of my favorites. There's a scene where Eric Little is looking down the lane where he's about to run. And I believe it's a 100-yard dash, just straight down the lane. And all from his vision you can see, and it's great filming, is the white lines and the tape. That's all he can see. He doesn't see the other runners. He doesn't see the other lanes lined up next to him. He just sees the tape straight out ahead of him. And that is the secondary reason for studying Bible prophecy, that we would see the tape. That we would look toward the finish line, the breaking of the tape, the receiving of the wreath of righteousness, the crown of righteousness, the runner's reward. It is so encouraging to me to be able to look ahead and to know what's coming. God did not intend for his people to be in the dark. He didn't intend for us to wander around uh, wondering what's it going to be like. Oh, I don't know, but hopefully good. He tells us what to look forward to. He gives us promise after promise. And biblical prophecy has so far been so specifically and literally fulfilled that we know everything yet to be fulfilled is going to be fulfilled in the same way. And it's an encouragement to us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.24, Don't you know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Run to win. Otherwise, get out of the race. What are you wasting your time for? Run to win. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Again, Paul, I believe, who wrote Hebrews, says, Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. And finally, at the end of his life, Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I fought the good fight. We always fit, focus on that part. He also says, I finished the course. He says, I've kept the faith. And in the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. To love is appearing is to be hungry for and seeking after Bible prophecy. Last week we ended our study with another prophetic promise of the coming kingdom age, that thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. Now I've been asked, and perhaps you wonder, Rick, do you really believe in a literal millennial kingdom here on the earth, a thousand year reign of Christ? And my answer is absolutely. Absolutely, if... If we truly take God at his word. Now, if we don't take God at his word, or we think he may be playing with us or toying with us, well, then possibly not. But if we believe that God's word is his truth, and he says what he means, and he means what he says, and I do, then I absolutely know, yes, Jesus is coming to reign for a thousand years. Psalm 65 from last week, verse 4 declares, We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. On down in verse 9. 
He, he said the stream of God is full of water, d- describing that great stream. Ezekiel saw, Zechariah saw, flowing out of the temple there in Jerusalem. It's going to be a day when, in verse 12, it tells us, the pastures of the wilderness drip, and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing, and the meadows are clothed with flocks, and the valleys are covered with grain. They shout for joy. Yes, they sing. So let me tell you, if there's anything in your life right now that kind of stinks, or isn't going well, or is hard, look down the lane and see the tape. Because a day is coming when every hard thing in life will be done. And we will be with Jesus forever. And we will enjoy that incredible kingdom. Now we start here because our next psalm, Psalm 66, is a psalm for the millennial age. We don't know who the psalm writer is. No one's named. If you look at Psalm 66, it just simply says, For the choir director, a song, a song, or literally a song psalm. <laughs> I'm not sure how that's different, but it's just a song psalm. And, and this psalm, it, some have suggested that Isaiah wrote it. Isaiah the prophet. Because the psalm itself has such a prophetic nature to it and speaks of the millennial kingdom. And Isaiah speaks quite a bit about the millennial kingdom. Others have suggested it was David himself. Or perhaps King Asa or Jehoshaphat or Hezekiah. Truth is, we really don't know. What we do know is God inspired it. God inspired this psalm. So there's a reason it's here. And when I can't determine what the past is, when we can't by study and, and understanding see what the history is behind the psalm, well, then I say let's, let's leave the murky past and go to the clear future. Which I believe is what this psalm is about. It'll divide itself very well into two sections. Verses 1 through 12 and then 13 through 20. In the first 12 verses, we're going to look at or hear a global call to worship. Worldwide worship, a calling of all people to worship God. In the second part, verses 13 through 20, we will see a personally compelling worship. So part one, a global call to worship. Part two, a personally compelling worship. Part one, global call to worship, verse one. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. Oh, come and see the works of God, who is awesome in His deeds toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There, let us rejoice in Him. He rules by His might forever. His eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Rick, what do you think? What makes you think this this call to worship is speaking of that time of the Millennial Kingdom? Why why would you believe that? Well, note this. In the first 12 verses, there are actually two subsections of this call. And the first one is, again, a global call to worship that is pervasive. This is for all the earth. All the earth. The invitation to shout joyfully is worldwide. Psalm 66 is purely a song of praise calling all the earth to worship. Now, I asked this question last week. Let me ask it again. Has there ever been a time when all the earth worshipped God? No, there hasn't. Well, I mean, you could, I guess, make a case when it was just Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, for that brief amount of time before they sinned. Or perhaps... In the hours after Moses, or Noah and his family stepped off of the ark, those eight people were told they sacrificed and worshipped there. So I guess you could say all the earth because they were the only human beings alive. But a global call of this massive level, as called for in this psalm, has never happened, which leaves us with one of two options. This is either wishful thinking on the part of the psalmist, or it will seek a wondrous fulfillment. And I don't believe the Bible tosses out wishful thinking. In a global call to worship, this is here because there is coming a day when the world will be called to worship and the world will. Isaiah 66 verse 23, the prophet said, It shall be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come bow down before me, says the Lord. Now, is he playing with us or is that going to happen? 
All mankind will come and bow down before me. Now note this, in verse 6, the psalmist makes an historical appeal. Back in verse 6, Psalm 66, he says, He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There, let us rejoice in him. He turned the sea into dry land. Well, you know what that is. That's the Red Sea. And the psalmist reaches back and says, Remember that? When, when Israel walked through three million people? Walked through the Red Sea on dry land as God parted it for them. Incredible miracle. It's one of the big ones. You know, it's the one that oftentimes in the Psalms and, and in the leaders of Israel, they refer back to that one quite a bit. He also mentions here that they passed through the river on foot. What river is that? Jordan. The Jordan. In that miraculous and wonderful scene, perhaps you recall what happened, the old story. They came to the Jordan River finally after their long trek through the wilderness. They're there. Joshua's there. They made camp. And the Lord says to Joshua, I want you to get the people ready. We're going to move out. Move out where? Straight across. This was at the season of the year that the Jordan was in flood stage. Okay, just so you know, it wasn't a trickle. It wasn't even what it looks like today. Many parts of the Jordan, people go to see it in Israel, and they're a little disappointed because it's not much wider than one of these roads in several places. In its widest places, maybe, maybe as wide across as the barn. But when it was in flood stage, the Jordan could be as wide as two miles and pretty deep. And so as Joshua and the people are standing there, the Lord says, prepare the people to go across. And he says, and, and furthermore, what I want you to do is, is have them wait to cross over until the Levites carrying the ark are some 3,500 feet out ahead of them. How's that going to be possible, Lord? Now, I know Joshua, in his mind, had to be thinking of the, of the Red Sea. Has, God's going to do this somehow. So he prepares the people. He gets them ready. Joshua 3, verse 8 says, You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Verse 13 of Joshua 3, he says, It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. The Bible goes on to tell us where that was. It was so far north that people could not possibly have seen it where they were. What's the point of all that, Lord? To teach the people to walk by faith and not by sight. I don't want you to see me doing the miracle. I just want you to step into the water, watch it stop flowing, and then go across. This is a, an amazing miracle because with the Red Sea, it was two walls on either side. And the people are watching and they're seeing the power of God. And in the Jordan crossing, God says, I don't want you to see the power. I just want you to know it's taking place somewhere. I want you to use your hearts and not your eyeballs this time around. We walk by faith. Not by sight. God is always cultivating faith in His people. We need to remember that. I have been reminded of this recently. God is always cultivating faith. He does it by taking our control from us. By doing things in which our lives we have no control over anymore. We just have to give it over to Him because we can't do anything. And I've got several areas of my life right now I won't go into and bore you with, but boy... No control here, no control here, no control here, no control there. I got two options. I can fall apart or I can believe. Faith. And that's what God is doing in us. It's not not what we see Him doing so much as what we know He will do. And this old story is so meaningful to Israel. But again, the call is pervasive. It is for all the earth. So why appeal to Israel's crossing of the sea and the river if this call is for all the earth? Watch this verse 7 going on. He says at the end of verse 6, There, let us rejoice in Him. He rules by His might forever. He rules by His might forever. Kyle and Delich, and notice the juxtaposition of these two verses. In the one, we're looking back to the Red Sea and the Jordan in history. And then the very next verse, it says, He rules by His might forever. And so the commentarians, Kyle and Delich, write, The sovereign power of God is always the same. He rules in His victorious might, not only over the world in the past, but in eternity to come. And therefore, as in the former days, so also in all the time to come. And what the psalmist is saying is, hey, world, worship God. Remember he did that amazing thing? 
Well, He rules like that forever. He will always be amazing. So this pervasive call to worldwide worship is of a God who is eternally victorious, past, present, and future, who rules by His might forever. His eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Now, now wait a minute. Rick, you're saying that this psalm is about the millennial kingdom. It's a call to worship in the millennial kingdom. Yes, I am. Okay, if, if that's the case, what's this about the rebellious? Let not the rebellious exalt themselves? I don't understand. Doesn't Jesus rule and reign with perfect righteousness over the earth in that thousand years? Over all people? Yes, he does. But catch this. Some of the worship in that time is going to be phony. There will be people in the millennial kingdom. Oh, they'll bow down because they have to. They'll worship because everybody else is. But in the heart... It will be, well, look back at verse 3. Feigned obedience. Did you catch that when we went by it? Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. Wait a minute. There are enemies of Jesus in the millennial kingdom? I believe there will be, yes. And they will obey, but it's going to be false. It's not going to be an obedience of the heart. It's an obedience of fear. They will obey, they will bow down, they will worship, but it's feigned obedience. The Hebrew word there is kachash. And I hope I didn't spit on anybody there. Kachash, which means deceitful. Deceitful obedience. A false worship going on. The worldwide worship will be happening. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But some of that confession will be deceitful. Or not to Jesus but to the rest who are worshiping. Some of this bowing is going to be bogus. It's astounding, but what it reveals is the depth of depravity and sin in the heart of man. You know, we we can fool each other. Can't fool Jesus. But in any given congregation of people, when worship is going on and eyes are closed, hands are lifted, people are singing, how do you know what's going on in the heart of the person next to you? I mean, how do you know that rather than actually even thinking about what they're saying, they're not running through the grocery list? (laughs) You don't know. And it's actually pretty easy to feign worship. I was a youth pastor for 15 years. I know how easy it is for people to fake worship on a Sunday morning and then the next Friday night for those same kids to be out partying and doing drugs and drinking and then back in church Sunday morning. Oh, Jesus. Feigned obedience. Jesus will maintain righteous authority on the earth. Every knee will bow. However, as Spurgeon writes, power, listen to this, power brings a man to his knees, but love alone wins the heart. Why would there be feigned obedience? Because there will be people afraid of Christ. There will be people recognizing His glory, His greatness, His power. And because of that, yeah, they'll bow when it's time to bow. And they'll worship when everybody else is worshiping. And they'll go through the motions... Because lordship demands loyalty. But love compels loyalty. And that's the difference. I pray that's the difference in all of our hearts. That we, Yes, we bow to the lordship of Christ, but we're not afraid of Christ. We fear Him. But we don't do what we do because we're afraid of what He's going to do to us. No, because we love Him so much. We respond in worship and in love. Right now... We reside in the age of grace. This is the time when God is patient. And it's astounding when you look at the world today and the rebellion of people toward God. But have you ever known a time? Have we ever seen a time in history where there was more loving kindness on the part of God? And tolerance. And, you know, steadfastness. He is just, He's giving us all the time we need. This is that age. The love of God, the grace of Christ is supremely offered to anyone, regardless of past sin, whoever you may have been, whatever you may have done, the love of Christ is there waiting for us to receive. God's patience is the hallmark of the day. How are people responding to His love in this age? Oh, there are some, some hearts that are absolutely won by it. When a person rushes into the waterfall of grace and realizes and are drenched by it and just 
They can't do anything but respond with worship. Others slap it away spitefully, which is still incredible. Others look at the offer of grace in this age of loving kindness, and they say, I don't want to be like you Christians. I don't believe in that God stuff. It's too judgmental. It's too, uh, you're intolerant. This is the age of grace. The millennial kingdom is going to begin with a saved, delivered, passionately thankful people. But a thousand years later, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, tell us that out of those passionate people will grow, will come a people who will rebel in a massive, worldwide, pervasive rebellion. It's astounding. Now you might say, well, how is that possible? And I'll answer that with a question. How does sin ever arise in the families that are faithful? You know, you, you parents who have kids who have grown up and right now are in rebellion. And you look back and, hey, as a parent of now two kids who are just fresh out of the house myself, I can say, boy, there are so many things I did wrong, but we tried, you know, which we tried to give them faith, to give them Jesus, to talk... And, and at this point, that's one of those areas of faith that I have to be stretched in, just letting they've got to make their decisions, and I hope they're the right ones. But if you have kids out of the house who are rebellious now, and you look back over it, and you, and you think to yourself, but we, we really tried, and we really did teach Jesus, and we really showed them the grace of God, and right now, they're in rebellion. How does sin ever arise in faithful families? How did it arise in God's family? With Adam and Eve, his first two kids rebelled and sinned against him. If your children are rebellious, know that. God's children are rebellious. Here's what's going to happen in the kingdom. There are those who are going to be ushered in by faith, and they will have offspring. What? Kids in the kingdom? Yes. Isaiah 65, verse 20 says, No longer will there be an infant in it who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days, for the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. What's Isaiah saying? That people are going to live a long time and catch it that children will be born to moms and dads in the millennial kingdom. Isaiah 65, 23 says, They will not labor in vain. They will not bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Well, wait, if they don't bear children for calamity, but we know the millennium ends with a calamity, how does that work? Well, they won't bear children for calamity because they're born into this perfect reign of Christ. In other words, (laughs) these will be children born into privilege, prosperity, and peace unlike any prior generation in the history of the world. Kids born into the millennium, I mean, what an opportunity. You don't even have to worry about the devil. He's bound in the abyss. You don't have to worry about temptation. You have the righteous, perfect reign of Christ right before you there. We have his, his church, those saints, you and I, Part of that royal government all over the earth. And and righteousness will be the standard. And morality and truth and values. And it will all be part of this wonderful kingdom. And children are going to be born into that. And they'll have every opportunity to be perfect. And they will still have free will. It's going to be really hard to sin in that thousand year reign. But it won't be hard to be rebellious in the heart. Which is why the psalmist says there will be feigned obedience. Incredible. Is it lordship or is it love with you? Do you bow down to the Father because you just love Him? Or do you bow down because you want to make sure you've picked up enough fire insurance for the week? Love or lordship? Feigned or faithful obedience? Now, the call to worship here is pervasive. However, the call to worship in this first section here is also peculiar in that it is uniquely connected to and through Israel. Watch this picking up in verse 8. Bless our God, O peoples, and sound His praise abroad, who keeps us in life and does not allow our feet to slip. Who's talking here? Watch, it's Israel. For you have tried us, O God, and have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. 
You laid an oppressive burden upon our loins. You made men right over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you brought us out into a place of abundance. And notice that is all past tense. All this happened. These bad things, these troubles, these trials. You brought us past tense through the fire and through the water. And this is what has happened to Israel. And these few verses are speaking of Israel's many deliverances across the ages. But at the time of global, worldwide worship, all of their deliverances will finally be done. What do you mean? I mean Israel won't need to be delivered anymore. It will be a thing of the past and a thing of praise and glory. Jesus said in Matthew 24, and you Bible students know this well, this is the parable of the fig tree. In the parable of the fig tree, a lot has been made about that, a lot of focus on that as to the fig tree being Israel. And as you see the fig tree ripening there, so, you know, summer is near in the same way. You know, be aware of that, that as you see the fig tree, Israel, coming into its own, people returning to the land, that the summer is near. 1948, Israel became a nation. The whole story there that, wow, so we are in these days. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now some say the generation is the generation alive at the time of Israel's rebirth as a nation. Which means we better hurry up. (laughs) Because 1948 and it's 2010 and uh, we don't have much of this generation left before we're on into the next one. Lord, there's another perspective. And I think both are probably accurate. I still lean, I, I go both ways on this. I think we're in the final generation myself. Could be wrong. But I love this perspective as well. Truly I say to you, this generation, the Greek word is genus, not genius, genus, will not pass away until all these things take place. The generation, the genus Jesus is referring to there is Israel. We translate it generation, but genus also means a people group. Israel will not pass away before all these things take place. What are you saying, Jesus? I will keep my people. They will remain to the very end and they will enter into that kingdom because I am a God who keeps my promises. Have you heard the latest attempt by the enemy to misrepresent those of us who take Scripture literally? I just heard this in the news the other day. Christians who support Israel do so just to usher in Israel's destruction for their own glorious exit. Those pre-tribulation, pre-millennial wackos out there. You know, who, who really believe that Israel's going to go through a seven years of wrath. And all they're doing supporting Israel right now is just preparing them for their disaster. And, and the church is going to get pulled out. Just pulled out. What kind of weirdness is that? And, and they're painting a picture of a people who are ourselves deceitful because we just want to go. So we're helping Israel as much as we can so we can go. It's not about loving Israel. It's about loving our own exit. And that's what we're doing here. You know, even Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has recognized this group of evangelical Christians to be among Israel's greatest supporters in the entire world. And not because we're trying to hurry up God's plan. The reality is we love Israel because God loves Israel. Not because of what we get. God's plan, and this is the thing that the world does not understand, prophecy is not what might happen. Remember? It's not what we hope will happen. Prophecy is what God has already seen happen. It's a done deal. So when we proclaim the tribulation, we're just saying this is what God's... This is coming. Why would we proclaim the tribulation? Why would we talk about the day of Jacob's trouble? Because we want to declare that though the day of Jacob's trouble, Israel's tribulation, is in fact coming, it is going to end with their vindication. We talk about it for their salvation, for God's glorification. It's the hope of of every believing Christian to see as many people saved, and, and careful with this, not converted to your way of thinking or mind, but saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, period. That's our hope. That's what it's about. 
And we want to see Israel vindicated as the Bible says Israel will be. Zechariah 8.23. Love this verse. Thus says the Lord of hosts. In those days, ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we've heard that God is with you. Isn't that great? In that day, people are going to be running up to every Jewish person they see and saying, I want to be where you are, man. What you have is awesome, and that's what I want. And I want to go where you are because I know God is right there with you. So there's a pervasive call to worship here, but there's also a peculiar one, and it is all connected to and tied to Israel. More on that in just a moment. In Psalm 66, the global call suddenly changes. And I like this. In verse 13, it suddenly becomes not a global call to worship, but a personally compelling worship. Verse 13 I shall come into your house with burnt offerings. I shall pay you my vows, which my lips uttered and my mouth spoke when I was in distress. You ever done that? (laughs) God, if you get me out of this one, I promise. That's what he's talking about. I said all kinds of things. Well, now that you've rescued me, I will fulfill all those things that I said. He says, verse 15, I shall offer to you burnt offerings of fat beasts, With the smoke of rams, I shall make an offering of bulls with male goats. I'm going to do it, Lord. I'm going to follow through now that I'm delivered, now that I'm rescued. Oh, now I'm going to do what I promised, what I said I would do. Come and hear, verse 16, all who fear God, and I will tell of what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard. He's given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his loving kindness from me. Suddenly the psalmist here goes from this corporate statement of global worship to a very personal worship. Does that ever happen to you? Maybe you've had this experience. You begin in the fellowship. Everybody's singing. Hey, it's good to see you too. Yeah, praise the Lord. And we're singing and we're in this together. And suddenly you reach a place in worship where it's as though you and the Lord are the only two people in the barn. It's just you two. I'll tell you what. When you get to that place in worship, you know you are fully worshiping God. Because everything just falls away. And it's just you and the King. And all oh, you love Him. And and you're proclaiming to Him all your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your passion for Him. And that's what's going on here with the psalmist. He's talking about all this global stuff, and and then Israel worshiping, and then he goes, And me, Lord, and I will follow through, and I will do all of this stuff. Why is that? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.14, The love of Christ compels us. We start to think about what God has done and what God will do and we start to recognize His love and we are compelled into worship. We recognize, as Paul writes, that one died for all and therefore all died. And He died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. And again, remember what Spurgeon said, power brings a man to his knees but love wins his heart. And it's the love of Christ that wins the heart of the worshiper. Listen, I don't get down on my knees because of God's awesome power. I get down on my knees because I have been awesomely loved. And I recognize that. And that's at the heart of the sacrifices here and the fulfilled vows in verses 13 through 15. You know, when you, when you know the love of God, no, no vow is too demanding. No sacrifice is too exacting. No offering that you might bring to the Lord. No service of worship is too much to ask. When you love the Lord and you know how much He loves you, well, the psalmist said in Psalm 110, verse 3, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. And so it's easy to follow through when you're caught up in the love. Um, Wait a minute, though. If this is during the Millennial Kingdom, that thousand-year reign, why the sacrifices? I mean, the sacrifices, I get that. In the Old Testament, all pointed to Jesus, right? Why the sacrifices now? You Bible students know. The sacrifices that used to point to Jesus will now commemorate what Jesus did. J. Vernon McGee puts it this way, just as they offered sacrifices in the Old Testament that pictured the coming of Christ, so they will offer sacrifices 
that will look back to Christ's coming. Every lamb will point to the Lamb of God, which taketh the sin of the world. John 1.29 And that's the best explanation I've ever heard for sacrifice and offering in the Millennial Kingdom. Because the Bible says there will be. There will be uh, offerings, just as we read in these three verses and in other verses that specifically you know, there's no denying this is all about the millennium. Well, there are offerings that will be sacrificed and given there. And the best explanation is those offerings will not be for sin. Those offerings will be in commemoration of Jesus dying for us, a looking back. And by the way, those kids that are born in the millennial kingdom, they're going to need some example, some picture, some idea of what happened before they arrived, what Jesus did. So that's what it's about. Now, Psalm 67. The author is also unknown, but we hear in it the voice of all Israel. It's as though the Jewish people themselves are singing Psalm 67 as God's people call out to the nations, again, to worship in this kingdom age. Psalm 67, verse 1. God, be gracious to us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. Wait, wait, how do you know it's Israel's call to the nations? Well, because of this first verse. Because it begins with a unique blessing given to Israel alone by Israel's first high priest. Listen to verse 1 again. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. Turning your Bibles back to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, book 4. Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke My name on the sons of Israel and I then will bless them. Keep your eyes right there on Numbers chapter 6 and listen as I read verse 1 of Psalm 67. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. You see the the repeat of that? Now, one quick thing before we leave Numbers chapter 6, I want you to see this. Verse 24 declares a blessing of the Father. Verse 25, a blessing of the Son. Verse 26, a blessing of the Spirit. The triune nature of God is in this blessing upon Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. That's God the Father. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. Well, that's Jesus whose face did shine upon Israel, who did bring grace to Israel and to all the world. And finally, the Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace, the Holy Spirit. So this blessing is a blessing on, it's upon Israel. So we come back to Psalm 67, and the blessing is recounted here in verse 1, and that's how we know, oh, this is Israel talking. Because they're remembering the blessing. God, be gracious to us, bless us, cause His face to shine upon us. That, and this is the hinge word in this opening here, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all the nations. The application of the blessing that was given to Israel is hinging on verse 2. That your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all the nations. That was the original plan of God for Israel and the world. Israel was the original group out the original ones, Isaiah 49, 6, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Israel was the original light to the world. Did that first plan fail? So God had to go to plan B, which was Jesus? Not at all. That first plan is the only plan and has been in place. It is coming off exactly as God planned it to come off. It's working perfectly. Romans 8, 8, or 11, 18, Paul said, Remember, it's not you who supports the root, which is Israel, but the root, Israel, supports you. We are here today 
because Israel is in part fulfilling their role and will more so fulfill that role even in the future. Paul says, you will say then the branches were broken off so I might be grafted in, which is what people say. It's what replacement theology says. Israel got broken off, and I am now grafted in, and the church is now Israel. But Paul goes on from there. He says, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. And in Romans 11.23, he says, and they also, if they don't continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And this fantastic plan of God is underway. The symbiotic relationship between Israel and the church. That Israel did... Jesus came through Israel, Messiah. Israel kept the word. Israel, the people of God, the original light to the nations, and the word began to get out through Israel. The original first century church, Jewish. The apostles, Jewish. Jesus himself, Jewish. And then Israel began to rebel and harden, and the branches got broken off, but will be grafted back in again. I just love the plan. It's incredible. In fact, at the end of Romans 11, Paul just goes off and says, Oh, the wonder and the glory and the praise of God is incredible. You know, he just, he, he just, it's like his mind just pops as he's thinking about how awesome God's incredible plan has been. Starting with Israel, bringing Jesus, and growing up the church, and then their jealousy of the church brings Israel back around and everybody gets saved. And that's God's idea. Well, not everybody but those who believe in Jesus Christ. Going on, verse 3. Let the peoples praise you, O God. So again, this is now Israel calling out. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. It's that broad spectrum of divine guidance here. Israel calling the nations to glad worship because God is now guiding the whole of the world. Verse 5. And let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God our God blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear Him. Everything will finally be in place. Everything is as God intended. Jew and Gentile in, in a right balance before the Lord. And even the original curse is lifted. What the original curse Genesis 3:17. To Adam God said because you've listened to the voice of your wife. I like to point this out to Cheryl every now and then. <laughs> and because you listen to your wife. <laughs> and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Let me be serious for a minute for a minute, men. If your wife leads you into sin, it is to your own foolishness. And I'm not saying that your wife intends to lead you into sin. But here is the first sign of a spineless husband whose wife was deceived, but Adam chose to sin. See, there's a difference. Eve was deceived. She didn't know what was going on. She got caught off guard and and Satan got her. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Why did he do it? I don't know. Because she was naked? I'm not sure. (laughs) But because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, listen, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and the proof is my backyard. (laughs) Thorns and thistles, man. And yet, look at this, verse 6. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us in that millennial kingdom. Oh, it'll be wonderful. No thorns, no thistles in the millennium. Paul says in Romans 8.20, The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. No thorns, no thistles. The earth will produce as God intended from the beginning, and all the ends of the earth will be glad and praise Him and fear Him. And here we have Israel calling for this kind of praise. Psalm 68. Psalm 68 can be called the Psalm of Ascension. Not the Psalms of Ascent, we'll come to those later, but the Psalm of Ascension, for it's written about the day the ark was brought up to Jerusalem and placed there in David's tabernacle 
which we talked about on Sunday a little bit. We opened up the first four verses here. It was that dedication service. Now, I'm going to borrow a little bit from it. If some of you use John Corson's commentary, it's a great commentary on the Bible. I encourage you to use it to get it. I'm going to borrow a little bit from him, but I'm going to make some alterations and additions to this. But note this. This whole psalm, Psalm 68, is a dedication service. For those of you who have come from a background maybe of more liturgical service, uh, churches, you know, Lutheran or, 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 or even Catholic, that everything's kind of, you have a, an order of worship, an actual printed out service, that's what Psalm 68 is. It's David's dedication service for the bringing up of the Ark of the Covenant to his tabernacle. Watch this. It begins with an invocation. Verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them exult before God. Yes, let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord, and exult before him. David's invocation, the service now has begun. Now you may recall from Sunday that these words were quoted. David took the words of Moses, who spoke these before the ark went up before the people. Rise up, O Lord! Numbers 10, 33 through 36. And so David now does the same thing. He invokes the same words that Moses used for the same ark that went before Moses and the people. I think that's marvelous. It's been 500 years And that same ark is now being brought up to Jerusalem, the fulfillment of God's promise that it was going to rest in the promised land. David must just be blown away. And so he pulls these same words out. And we, like Moses before David, and like David before us, we can invoke this prayer. Let God arise. As the ark indicated God's present spirit to guide Israel on their sojourn, we have that GPS God's present spirit, as we talked about, going out before us to the very next place of worship. Now, quickly, before we go on, I have to address something I said on Sunday because I've gotten some response and reaction about the brown lantern in Anacortes. People are saying, I can't believe you said we can't go in the brown lantern. I didn't say that. You said we can't eat there? I didn't say that. I said, and I quote, because it was in my notes, I have a hard time believing God would lead me into the brown lantern. That's what I said. I didn't say don't eat lunch there or don't eat dinner there. I just said I have a hard time believing my GPS, my God's present spirit right there would say, hey, go have lunch with the brown lantern, man. Go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, Rick, isn't that the same thing? Well, here's a caveat. I have a hard time believing God would lead me into the brown lantern unless it's after 9 p.m. during alcohol time with my Bible ready to talk about the gospel to the lost. Now, that's a great reason to go into the brown lantern. Take your Bible and go at 9 o'clock. Hey, who wants to study the Word of God? I brought my guitar. You want to sing? Not drunken songs. Want to worship? I've got to respond to this because, again, I had some people say, Rick... The best burgers in town are at the Brown Lantern. I get it. A few years ago, I got it. Okay, I understand. The best onion rings are there. That's where we always go for lunch. That's our favorite spot. And we don't go after 9 o'clock. We just go at lunchtime, you know. Well, okay, just remember, every buck you plunk down for a burger funds the 9 o'clock hour. Well, if you're going to use that kind of rationing, we better just stop spending money at all because it all goes to sin. I understand that. (laughs) Let me answer the, the question about the brown lantern with a passage from Romans 14. Paul writing, Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. In my own mind, Rick, personally, I cannot eat at the brown lantern. I, I won't. And I know the food's great. But I won't go in there. And it's not because, you know, there are other establishments I go into that I'm sure there's something seedy being done with the money. I, you know, I don't know it for sure. The Brown Lantern, I know for sure where it's going. I, I know what goes on in, in the late of night. And I know, I know marriages that have been wrecked because of people going there and getting drunk and hooking up and, and having adulterous affairs. I'm aware of alcoholism that is spurned and encouraged by that. So as a pastor and as a Christian personally, personally, 
I am fully convinced in my own mind I can't go in there and I don't believe God's presence spirit would lead me in there. Now, listen though, because Paul says, he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. So you can almost say those who go into the brown lantern, man, you better do so to the glory of God. And to those who choose not to go in there, you better do so to the glory of God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. Here's what I'm saying. What I am hearing in my convicted heart, not yours, I'm not judging, I'm not pouring out a guilt trip. What I'm hearing in my convicted heart is let God arise. What does that mean for me? Shouldn't that change some of my most comfortable behaviors? Can I stand for Jesus Christ? In this location, or in that location, or by this behavior. And Cheryl calls me on this stuff. You just need to know. She does. You know, a few weeks back, I was talking about if you're driving in your car and you get cut off. I don't know if you remember this, and I said what you need to just say is, Amen, come Lord Jesus. You know what happened? Right after that sermon, we got in the car and drove to California. (laughs) And the first time... I use the word moron. I admit. I confess. Oh, I can't believe you see what that moron just did. And sure it says, Amen, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> Don't you use my words against me. <laughs> but you know what? I didn't like it. But she was right. She was right. Let God arise in every circumstance of our lives. If I'm serious about Him being my GPS then I have to ask, Lord, are you leading me personally through these doors? And you struggle with that between you and the Lord. As for me, I know where I'm at. David begins this great psalm with an invocation, and he then goes into the next section, commemoration. Invocation, secondly, commemoration, verse 5. A father to the fatherless. And a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Have you been fatherless? Widow? Have you been lonely? Have you felt as though you were a prisoner? Have you been rebellious in a dry place? You know, it's amazing. God is a father. God is one who he, he offers his holy habitation. If you have been in any of those places, or if you are right now, husbandless, fatherless, lonely, imprisoned, abandoned, there is a place you can go. And the place is his holy habitation. Well, what's that? Well, for David, it was the tabernacle. But for us in this age, it's a far better place. It is far more immediate. John 14, 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. God has chosen in this age to make his holy habitation your heart. Wow! I mean, wow! That's astounding. David bringing the ark into the tabernacle and dancing with joy before the ark. And as it comes in, you have to know he was thrilled beyond measure that the ark of God and the presence of God was going to be right there. City of David just below the temple or or the temple mount. And right up there on the temple mount, oh, that's where the tabernacle is. And any time I want, I can go up and know God is right there. And David was thrilled. How much more you and me knowing at any moment I can turn and the Lord is... Right here. His holy habitation. Marvelous. Wonderful. Lydia, it, that was, that's your question. There are a group of kids who, who were meeting for Bible study on Friday. And she asked a question from last week's study. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? And I'm like, wow. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? That's huge. It's this. That my Father and I make our abode in your heart. That we are immediate and present. And you got questions? You ask because God is there. And that's what that means. And now he goes on, verse 7, he says, O oh God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked. 
The heavens also dropped. By the way, the word rain is not there. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Dropped what? I would suggest manna. They imply rain because rain is talked about in the next verse, but the heavens dropped manna. God was providing for His people. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Remember, they hadn't even reached Sinai when they were receiving manna on the ground in the morning. They hadn't even gotten the Ten Commandments. God is already providing for His people. They hadn't even had an opportunity to obey the law of the Lord. And God's feeding them. And God's providing fresh water from bitter and water from the rock. And manna in the mornings, and that wasn't enough. They wanted meat, so he provided quail till it was coming out of their nostrils. Remember that? God said, you want meat? I'll give you meat. So you're so stuffed and sick of it, all you want is my sweet manna. All that provided. And then they came to Sinai and they quaked. Verse 9, you shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. You confirmed your inheritance when it was parched. Or the Hebrew word also means weary. Oh, the people were weary and tired and hot. And at some point, we haven't even seen this in the biblical narrative, but at some point, it just started to rain. Oh, sweet rain on Israel. God providing for His people. In an amazing way, verse 10, Your creatures settled in it. You provided your goodness for the poor, O God. It's interesting he says your creatures because it wasn't just the people of Israel. It was also the flocks and the herds and and all the animals of Israel. And God was providing for everyone. He was taking care of the people and their livestock. Your creatures settled. You provided. Oh God. So this is the march of the ark. Now remember this whole thing is couched in a service of the bringing up of the ark of the covenant. And that's why David is recounting this. Because Moses said, let God arise, and the ark went out. So David says, let God arise, and the ark's going up. And he's now recalling for Israel in this wonderful service, in this commemoration, that here goes the march of the ark, God leading the people through the promised land all the way to the border. And there at the border, the commemoration continues in the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the judges. Look at verse 11. This is great. The Lord gives the command. By the way, it's not command, it's word. Now the reason they say command is because it's God gives the word. And the word is go. You know, God gives the word. The women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. The women. The women. Now before I get to the women, note here again in verse 11 that the Lord is now Adonai. Adonai. The name Adonai, the Hebrew, literally means sovereign or master. And what's interesting is as David's tracking the march of the ark, Adonai is the name Joshua used when he met the Lord. Same name. When he met the Lord, yeah, he was near Jericho. Joshua's out there looking over the land, no doubt considering his attack plan, how he was going to organize and fight against Jericho. And he sees suddenly a man with a drawn sword who appears before him. Joshua says, you for us or for them? And the man answers, and I think this is marvelous. He says, no, (laughs) I'm not for you or for them. I am the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua, we're told, fell on his face, Joshua 5.14, fell on his face to the earth, bowed down, and he said to him, what has my Lord Adonai, What has my Lord to say to his servant? Note this. Joshua bowed down and worshipped. For a man to bow down and worship anyone other than God was wrong. It was sin. It was denied in the law of Moses, which they did have by this point. Joshua bows down and worships and calls the man with the drawn sword, Lord. Who is the man? Adonai. Israel's commander-in-chief, I believe none other than Jesus Christ, in a Christophany. And so Joshua sees him there and talks to him and calls him Lord. So now here we are, we're on the border, we begin to go into the promised land, the fighting happens and it says again, the women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. And ladies, you've got to love this, what women? First one out, Deborah. Deborah the judge. In a time in Israel where, honestly, the men were abdicating their authority. So along comes Deborah, and she's judging. And the Canaanites are coming after Israel and are threatening a great destruction. And so Deborah, 
realizes we've got to do something. She calls Barack to him and says, Barack, I want you to go and fight. And Barack says, well, I'm not going to fight if you don't come with me. <laughs> Deborah says, all right. And so they go and they meet the Canaanites in a great victory on Mount Tabor there in Israel. And from that great victory comes another hero, another woman. There's Deborah. There's also Yael. Yael in Judges chapter 4 We see the story. The exhausted Canaanite commander Sisera fled from Deborah's attack. He's running for his life. And he comes to the tent of Yael. Now, Yael and her husband Eber are two people that Sisera knew from before because they had dwelt in Canaanite territory before. So Sisera thought he could trust them. He runs to them and goes, hey, guys, you've got to hide me. And so I love this. We're told that Yael, she gave him a cup of milk and she tucked him sweetly into bed. And she drove a tent peg into his skull. Great, great story. (laughs) If you ever are just feeling a little extra violent, read the book of Judges. Okay, you just just need your your fix on the violence of the day. It's amazing. She drives a tent peg through his head, and she conquers the commander of the Canaanite army, this woman, Yael, as Deborah as Deborah conquers the Canaanites as well, this woman, this leader, what is it? The women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she, who remains at home, will divide the spoil. Yael wasn't out fighting, she was just at home. And the enemy came to her, and she took him out. But ladies, if you are just at home, you may think your role is not that important. I guarantee you an opportunity will come when the enemy will come to your home. Drive a tent peg through his head. How do I do that? Just proclaim Jesus over your household. Live for Jesus at home as well as you do at work. Now, this continues on. Verse 13. When you lie down among the sheepfolds, you're like the wings of a dove covered with silver and its pinions with glistening gold. Huh? It's one of those verses that if you read it, just reading through the Bible, you come to it and you go, okay, have no idea, and you just continue on. You know. Well, let's stop for a second. Because this also deals with the same story in Judges 4 and 5. This verse, uh, Psalm 68, 13, recalls the song of Deborah in Judges 5, specifically related to the tribe of Reuben. And this is about Reuben. The call went out from Deborah to all of Israel. Come fight! Come fight against the Canaanites! Reuben doesn't show up. Reuben chooses not to help. Reuben's on the other side of the Jordan. And yeah, our people, you know, in the promised land, on the right side of the, of the river, they're having trouble, but we got our sheep out here. And so the Reubenites gathered, and they talked about it, and they thought, well, if we were to go, what would that look like? And they had committees that got together to decide what the best battle plan would be if they were to cross and help Deborah. Meanwhile, the ba- battle's over, and they miss it. Well, how do you know all this, Rick? Well, Deborah said this in her song, Judges 5.16, Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. What you did, she's saying, Reuben, you meant well, but you were sheepish. (laughs) You stayed with the sheep, and you talked about engaging, but you didn't engage. And so Reuben is among the tribes of Israel that are first listed in Deborah's Hall of Shame because they didn't show up. Zebulun showed up. Benjamin, Judah, Naphtali, these, these groups, these tribes fought and fought valiantly. Reuben stayed home. Reuben was part of the people, but they did not engage. And that's eerily similar to some in Christianity who are all about rumination and no response. Think about it. Love to talk about it. Love to share the things. Like to stay among the sheep. But let God arise, I would rather have my burger than let God arise. Oh, now, Rick, you are pouring out a guilt trip. Okay, maybe I am. What does the rest of verse 13 mean, however? When you lie down among the sheepfolds, you're like the wings of a dove covered with silver and its pinions with glistening gold. Note this, the word when at the beginning of the verse is also translated if. If. If you lie down among the sheepfolds, the wings of a... You or like was added, so drop that. If 
You lie down among the sheepfolds, the wings of a dove covered with silver, and its pinions with glistening gold. What is this saying? What does the rest of it mean? This is beautiful. This is worth the whole night. So if you're snoozy, listen to this. Silver in the Bible indicates what? What is silver a picture of over and over in Scripture? Those of you who know this. You remember? Let me give you a hint. The firstborn of all man and animals belong to the Lord. The firstborn. So if you had a firstborn son, a firstborn daughter, they belong to the Lord. If you had a firstborn sheep, it belonged to the Lord. And the animals were immediately sacrificed. You buy a sheep and it has a little sheep, a lamb. That lamb is now for sacrifice because it belongs to the Lord. You buy a cow and it calves, that calf belongs to the Lord. It's your firstborn. It's got to go to the Lord. You have a son or a daughter... What do you do? Well, you don't sacrifice because God is abhorred. Uh, a human sacrifice is abhorrent to God. So what they do, as to their redemption price, Numbers eighteen sixteen, from a month old you shall redeem them by your valuation five shekels in silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures, silver is always connected to redemption. Redemption. What about the dove? Well, the dove, to the Hebrew mind, was a sacrificial bird. And the dove was a type of Christ. What this verse is saying, and this is wonderful, even if we hide out among the sheep, the sacrifice of Jesus, get this, still redeems. Read it this way. Psalm 68, 13. If you lie down among the sheepfolds, if you flake out, if you're negligent, if you're a spiritual wimp... (laughs) The wings of the dove are covered with silver and its pinions with gold. The wings of our sacrificial Christ are covered with redemption. Even if you don't show up to fight, but you're part of the sheep, redemption is going to reach you. Deborah was saying, Reuben, you flaked, but you're still our brothers. You're still part of the family. And those of us who flake from time to time, this is good news. If we are faithless, 2 Timothy 2, 13, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Oh, cool. So I can just sit back and relax and do nothing and I'm redeemed anyway. Awesome. That's what I'm going to do. You know, I've never seen that happen. I've never seen that happen. When someone recognizes and understands their redemption, it has the opposite effect on the heart. It doesn't make you flaky. It makes you faithful. When we see redemption for what it is, man, we take off on gospel wings of glistening gold. Verse 14. Now when the Almighty, and suddenly it's not Adonai, it's Shaddai. When the Almighty scattered the kings there, it was snowing in Zalman. Well, great, David, thanks for the weather report. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, in essence, the kings of the nations were scattered like snow, a blizzard of fleeing adversaries. In that day, when the battle commenced and when it concluded, man, the kings fled, just like flurries of snow. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. And again, he's calling God now by the name Shaddai, Almighty, because as the land was conquered, it was clear whose God was Almighty. Now, what's the point of all this commemoration? David spends quite a bit of time. They're bringing the ark in, and this is being sung. This is part of that dedicatory service. Why all this commemoration? Because commemoration, listen, commemoration builds faith. It builds our faith. That's why Hebrews 11 is what we call the great hall of faith. It just goes through listing all those people of faith over the years and how faithful they were. It's why songs like By Faith that that we just sung a few minutes ago are so meaningful to me personally. By faith, our fathers roamed the earth with the power of His promise in their heart of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. Now, when I read the biographies of men and women of faith over the past 2,000 years, but even in the past couple hundred years, it inspires my faith. When I look at what people have done for the Lord, I just think, I could do so much more. I want to be like that. And so David is commemorating this this march of the ark leading forth in Israel and the great deeds that God did because it lifts up and builds up our faith so that we can stand as children of the promise. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. we got a cloud of witnesses around us, cheering us on, saying, Go! And when we consider that cloud of witnesses, it builds up our faith. Number three, as this service continues, we have invocation, commemoration. Hang with me, we're almost done. Celebration. Now, verse 15, celebration. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O mountains with many peaks, at the mountain which God has desired for his abode? Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. David's making a marvelous comparison. We've seen this verse before. Mount Bashan was a many peaked map, is a massive mountain there in Israel across the border. Huge mountain range. And David says, but that huge mountain range is looking at the tiny little ridge of Mount Moriah, which, if you've been to Israel, you hardly even know that you're on a mountain. Mount Moriah, it doesn't seem like a mountain, it's more of a ridge just running through Jerusalem. That little peak, but the great mighty mountains of Bashan. Are jealous of that? Yeah. Why? Because God's there. Because God chose that mountain even over the mighty Bashan. Verse 17. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. You have ascended on high. You have led captive your captives. You've received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. And this again is why it's called the Psalm of Ascension, because it speaks of an ascension, an incredible ascension. Actually, it speaks of two. Historically, David's recounting his own ascension up the hills of Jebus, which is the city Jerusalem. It was called Jebus. Because the Jebusites, they lived there. And 1 Chronicles 11.5, it, it It details that march, that going up and taking and conquering the Jebusites. Historically, what David's talking about here is himself. And and God, really, you being God leading him, you've ascended on high. You've led captive your captives. you received gifts among men, even the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. And he's talking about, historically, Jerusalem. We conquered the city. We ascended. We took it. But prophetically... This talks about, you know, not David, but the son of David, Jesus Christ. Paul grabs hold of it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Therefore it says, when, and compare this, look at what David wrote. When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Well, that's different, isn't it? David says he received gifts among men. Paul changes it by the Spirit, changes it slightly to say, you gave gifts to men. And Paul goes on and says, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended himself is also he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. Well, that's Jesus, who who first, man, he descended into the lower parts and he led the captive spirits of the faithful from Sheol up to glory as he ascended where the spirits now of everyone who has died in faith before the cross and after the cross, everyone who died in faith in the Lord, Jesus brought up through the redemption he paid for at the cross as he ascended. Their spirits are with the Lord. Their bodies in the earth. Their spirits with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 4, if you don't understand that, explains it perfectly. Go home and read that. But Paul also wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, Being of good, church, of good courage and knowing while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, but prefer rather to be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. Because that's what happens when you die in faith in Jesus. Your spirit is with Him immediately. Your body, buried, waiting. Waiting for what? To be raised up and reunified with your spirit and glorified in that instant when we are called home but in the spirit Paul changes the verse in Ephesians David historically received gifts among men as he conquered Jebus the plunder of Jebus but after Jesus ascended he did the opposite he gave gifts to men his Holy Spirit spiritual gifts celebration 
Number four, anticipation. Now we move forward as the service continues. And David looks around and realizes, man, the service has been going on a while, so we've got to hurry. Verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. God is to us a God of deliverances. And to God the Lord belong escapes from death. Escapes from death. We're going to talk about this more on Sunday, but let me just ask this question. Is belief in the rapture of the church, is it just Christian escapism? Yes, of course it is. You bet it is. You don't want to escape? You don't want to be out of here at the right time? I do. Jesus said in Luke 21, 36, keep on the alert at all times, praying that you have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Verse 21, surely God will shatter the head of his enemies, speaking in anticipation of Satan. Shatter the head of the enemy. And the hairy crown of him who goes on in his guilty deeds. Who's that? Antichrist. The Lord said, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea. This speaks of a glorious future deliverance and victory for Israel and all those who believe in Jesus. Satan, the shattered head of the enemy. Genesis 3.15 says, He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Antichrist, the hairy crowned enemy, the return from the depths of the sea, speaking of their final judgment. Verse 24, they have seen your procession, O God. Wait a minute. Now, track this. They. Who is they? The enemies. All right? The enemies of the Lord have seen your procession, O God. The procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers went on, the musicians after them, in the midst of the tambourines, or in the midst of the maidens beating tambourines. Bless, bless God in the congregations, even the Lord, you who are of the fountain of Israel. And he says, there's Benjamin. Oh, there's Benjamin. And the youngest ruling them, the princes of Judah in their throng, and the princes of Zebulun, and the princes of Naphtali. Listen, understand what's going on here. We move quickly from anticipation to procession. This great procession is going on. And David saying, even the enemies of the Lord have seen this glorious procession of the ark up to Jerusalem. Procession. For his day, David saying, the enemies have seen this. The enemies of God have watched this ark go from Mount Sinai all the way to Mount Moriah. They have seen it. But listen, gang, this explains why Satan is ramping things up in these last days. Because Satan has seen God's unstoppable procession from day one. He's been watching it take place. And it's freaking him out. Because no matter what he tries to do, let's, let's introduce something into the bloodline of man to mess things up. And God floods the earth, saves Noah, and the procession continues. Well, let's get all the people together to build a monument to themselves. And God messes with the languages and spreads them all over the earth. And the procession continues. Let's kill every male child of Israel. Therefore, no deliverer can come. And a little baby is put in a basket. And the procession continues. And you can track it all the way down the line. Frustrating for Satan. The ark coming up to Jerusalem is just another step in this great procession that cannot be stopped. Why are only four tribes named? You see them there. Benjamin, Judah, Zebulun, Naphtali. Honestly, I think simply, these are the ones David saw there. These are the four who showed up for the dedicatory service of the ark being put into the tabernacle. Benjamin, Judah, Zebulun, Naphtali. Just those four. And that's kind of sad. Because there were twelve. Where are the other eight? Why are they not even mentioned? Why aren't they there? If you do nothing else for the Lord, and kids, I want to speak this to all of you over here specifically. Listen to me. If you do nothing else for the Lord, show up. Show up. Be involved at church. Go to youth group. Show up. Just be there. You don't have to plan to do great things. God will take care of that. Just Show up. Because if you don't show up, you miss it. You miss the procession. Don't miss it. Now, 
now. The enemies of God, they have their own procession going on at the same time. Verse 28. God, your God, has commanded your strength. Show yourself strong, O God, who acted on our behalf. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring gifts to you. And they will. Kings will bring gifts up in the millennial kingdom. But verse verse 30, they say, he says, Rebuke the beasts in the reeds. The herd of bulls with the calves of the peoples, trampling underfoot the pieces of silver. He has scattered the peoples who delight in war. What's going on there? Three types of worldly rebellion. Those who set themselves against Israel and God, represented here by the beasts and the reeds. What's that? Probably crocodiles. Or perhaps hippopotamuses in the Nile River in Egypt. This is drawing attention to the enemy of Egypt. And he says after that, the herd of bulls. Well, Apis was the bull god of the pharaohs. The god of strength and power and virility. Where do you think the Israelites got the golden calf idea in the first place? From Egypt. And Apis was that bull god, a a huge bull, and, and they considered that to be a great god. The herd of bulls, which indicates the pharaohs then of Egypt and the calves of the people. Well, that would be the people of Egypt. Setting themselves against God. Those who set themselves against Israel and God, as Egypt did, are in worldly rebellion. Secondly, those who step on redemption. He says, trampling underfoot the pieces of silver. Remember, silver, picturing redemption in the Bible, Numbers 18, 16. Those who would trample redemption. uh, You know them, they're the ones who say, I don't need redemption. I don't need grace. I don't need your Jesus. I'm good enough on my own. You're trampling redemption. And you're in rebellion to the Father. And finally, those who seek war. Those who delight in war, he said, in contrast to the peace of the coming kingdom. And now the profession, as it rounds out, goes prophetic. Verse 31, envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. In what? In worship. The day is coming. When there will be envoys of Egypt, the enemy of the people of Israel, and yes, even to this day, I understand there's a peace treaty there. But watch what's going on. Because Egypt is more and more setting itself against Israel again. But not in the millennial kingdom. No envoys are going to come right out of Egypt up to Jerusalem to praise and worship God. They're going to come out of Ethiopia to praise and worship God. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. And we're back to a worldwide praise. Sing praises to the Lord. The tables are turned. Now David concludes the whole liturgy. And we are study. As we are again directed to a time yet future when Jesus comes to reign. And Israel comes into her kingdom and all the earth is blessed in this marvelous number six benediction. Invocation, commemoration, celebration, anticipation, procession, and finally benediction. Verse 33. To him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times. Behold, he speaks forth with his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel and his strength is in the skies. Oh God, you are awesome from your sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. And you can almost imagine the ark. Then it goes into David's tabernacle. Behind into the holy place, further into the holy of holies, where it rests as the people praise the Lord. And David rounds it all out saying, blessed be God. Last question. What blesses God? What is it that blesses God? Let's let God arise in your heart and in your life. Follow the godly presence of His Spirit. And simultaneously, as you are letting God arise, you will be a blessing to the Lord.